Yes, so hi everyone and welcome to this uh, session on user-oriented design and innovation, uh, which is a part of the, the developer track, uh, because it's partly related to development uh, of apps, uh, while also kind of taking a bit of a broader perspective on these issues of design uh, and innovation with DHS2. So my name is Magnus Lee. Uh, I'm uh, working at the University of Oslo, where I lead this DHIS2 Design Lab uh, project uh, and also doing research. Uh, yes. So in this session, as I mentioned, uh, we will um, take a bit of a broader perspective on design and innovation and particularly oriented towards addressing the needs of end users. Uh, and the reason for this being part of the development track and app development track is that apps and app development uh, is uh, an important part of this design issue as it provides this arena where we actually can uh, have the flexibility to design and innovate more um, uh, new things that are not part of the generic features of DHS2. So but again, uh, it's not just about apps, but also more about uh, design approaches, the project structures and the capacity that is needed in order to drive these uh, kind of innovation processes. So just a few words about the design lab for those who did not attend the small session yesterday. Um, this design lab project at the University of Oslo includes a group of master students, I think from 15 to 20 students we are now, uh, and also some researchers that are collaborating with um, the HS2 practitioners uh, on multiple levels, both here at the core team and also in, in um, implementation groups, uh, HISP groups uh, in different countries. Uh, to try to look at what are the current kind of innovation and design practices specifically related to designing for end users and how can we kind of strengthen these, these uh, practices and uh, try to make DHS2 more usable and relevant to what is becoming an increasingly diverse audience of users, both within health, but also now increasingly also in older contexts and multiple contexts within health. Uh, and we do this by working with uh, practitioners uh, in, for example, particular implementation projects. Uh, we have been working with HISP India, uh, HISP Mozambique and others uh, to see how these implementation processes unfold and then to test out and uh, look at and explore the challenges of, of doing innovation in these contexts. Uh, so the structure of this session will be first to try to define some concepts and to make some kind of nuances with these concepts. For instance, what we mean by user-oriented design and innovation and what we mean by usable and relevant technologies. And then we will look a bit more concretely at some key challenges of doing this kind of design and innovation uh, in the context of implementing the HS2. And then finally discuss some uh, plans we have in the design lab for the future, which also includes hopefully some collaboration with potentially some of you that are, are attending this track. So moving to this uh, concept of user-oriented design and innovation, uh, our aim in the lab with this is to, to as mentioned, make uh, DHS2 more usable and relevant. We see that there are many different user groups and there are some user groups who have great value of DHS2 in, in decision making, for example, getting data and presentations of data uh, that supports uh, work processes and strengthens healthcare. While there are a lot of other user groups that could have more benefit of DHS2 if we were to design and innovate more with these different groups. Uh, and I constantly refer to this uh, term usable and relevant throughout this uh, session. And with that, I basically mean that something that is usable and relevant have user interfaces and functionality and features 
that are uh, both perceived as easy to use and learn. So it has kind of usability. It's uh, easy for the users to, to use it. Of course, uh, pending or relative to the task that it's being supported. Advanced tasks also needs kind of advanced systems, but not simple tasks should not be very difficult to do with a usable uh, software. Uh, but also related to whether the system is perceived as providing value to the work of users. So these are very interrelated, but also a bit kind of separate aspects. One is about, you know, making something that is easy to use. The other is about making something that really provides value to the work of the user. Meaning that it supports something in a better way than something, or it solves an issue, makes work easier or more efficient, these kind of things. And I think uh, what is important when we talk about these concepts, uh, because there is a kind of common uh, misconception that design and user oriented design is about, you know, finding the right colors of buttons and you know what is the right uh, label for this and that, uh, that uh, uh, menu or so on and so forth. Uh, but it's also a, a bit more kind of deeper. That's certainly a part of it, but it's also about uh, what is kind of uh, typically said as building the right thing, meaning building something that is actually relevant in this context for the given set of users, and then building that thing right, meaning, for example, making it easy to use and understand and, and learn. And I think that's it's just important to have that in mind that it's not just about fancy user interfaces or user interfaces with the right colors and labels and texts, but also about what is actually a useful thing in this context when we are designing. So when we are uh, implementing the HS2 and we, we want to support the work of some users, for example, in health, what kind of features would make this uh, the right thing for them to provide value to their work? And just a bit about why this is relevant. Uh, there are some obvious benefits of, of investing in thinking about these aspects of, uh, of and designing with users and thinking about usability and relevance and so on. Uh, one is that typically systems that are easy to use and, and learn requires le less user training. Uh, and also you might have a higher user acceptance, uh, maybe also less errors, for example, during data entry or during use, which again increases data quality and makes better decisions based on that data. But also, and maybe increasingly important with all these app resources uh, and uh, the possibility of developing radically kind of new tools for the HS2 is that it also helps drive design and innovation processes of totally new kind of tools that support the work of, of different types of health workers or other uh, or workers in other domains. And of course, also these local innovations, let's say you are doing a, a design and innovation project in a specific implementation, we often see that things that are relevant in one context might also be relevant other places. So based on these local design processes, that also might feed into being generic innovations, for example, published on the DHS2 app hub, which Austin talked about yesterday. So one issue with DHS2 and also which it shares with a lot of other kind of generic software solutions is that what is the right thing uh, for the users and the right thing uh, or the right way to build it and so on and so forth could typically vary across contra uh, contexts. So something that is very usable and relevant in uh, Uganda at a certain context there might might not be relevant in another place and so on and so forth. And this makes it very hard for the core team to, to, to design kind of a one size fits all solution that works perfectly anywhere. So typically what is usable and relevant depends a lot on the practices and the way things are organized in the specific context where the system is going to be used. And this is very hard to then accommodate when you're designing for multiple contexts. Uh, 
thus uh, doing these kind of user-oriented design processes uh, should also be an important aspect of the implementation of a DHS2. Uh, so when the software is taken into a concrete context, then uh, it is important to them to work uh, with the specific needs in that context. And again, apps is then one approach to kind of addressing very specific needs in this context. And because of this, in this design lab that we are running here, we have a very particular focus on the implementation level design, as we call it, uh, where some of our key questions are, how can DHS2 be customized and extended to meet very particular needs? So needs that are not met by the generic features or let's say user interfaces or functionality that is not ideal in a context, how can kind of that uh, be responded to on the level of implementation without going through the whole kind of uh, JIRA cycle and, and making all the changes in the kind of generic bundle of DHS2. Uh, then also what are appropriate design methods? So what kind of methods can we use to, for example, engage with users, prototype and evaluate with users and so on and so forth? And then what kind of resources could be provided from, uh, from uh, the side of the core developers and from the design lab and from, and from kind of the generic level uh, to better support this. And again, one very good example here are these app development resources, both for web and Android, which for, for instance makes it much more efficient and easy to develop uh, apps and tools based on specific needs, but then also what about, for example, methods and processes, implementation guidelines, and so on. So these things are, uh, are stuff that we are exploring in the, in the design lab. So just to say a bit about what we mean about uh, innovation uh, and also kind of who we are designing for and how. And I think two key questions is what are we actually building when we are implementing the HS2? And I will touch upon the difference between the concept of digitization and digital innovation, which are two related but different things. Uh, and who are we then building these things for? So who are these, these uh, things that we're designing and developing relevant for? So this is just to kind of get on the same page uh, on what, what we kind of mean by innovation and design and to, to try to create maybe some ideas and awareness uh, around this. So uh, there is an important difference between what we call digitization and digital innovation. So digitization, that refers to actually making kind of a digital version of an analog system. So taking something analog and making it into something digital. So some uh, would call this putting electricity on paper. So uh, for example, taking a paper-based uh, system and then kind of making the exact same system, but with a digital system. Then digital innovation, uh, that is actually a bit of a, it's a bit of a more uh, extensive thing where uh, some have defined it as uh, combining digital technology uh, in a new way and also potentially with physical non-digital components, which enable some kind of social technical change and create new value uh, to the adopters or the users. So this means that in contrast to digitization, where you're kind of building the same system in a digital format with digital innovation, then you're doing something new using these digital capabilities, uh, which results not only in that, okay, now something is not analog anymore, it's digital. It actually enables some kind of social technical change, changes in work practices, changes in how people work, uh, the services that they can offer, these kind of things. And thus then creating some kind of new value for these adopters of this technology, for instance, the end users. And if we look at uh, implementations of a lot of software, including the HS2 in, in many countries, I think we can see a lot of uh, traces of digitization. Uh, that things that have been on paper is transferred into a 
digital format, but for at least some user groups, it kind of stops there. So previously, uh, for instance, data was entered on paper. Now it's entered on uh, a digital surface uh, desktop computer, for example. So this is an example for that specific user. This is an example of a digitization process. This gets a bit complicated because for the people that are using this data, that they, they might have some kind of digital innovation, for example, because they might use the data in different ways because it's now comes in a digital format and can be used in other ways. But for one user group, this is the case. And a recurring thing that um, I experienced by being out and talking to users different places in the world, uh, uh, for example, with the HS2, is that a lot of end users actually still prefer paper forms. So then this quote is from a user somewhere uh, saying that I prefer the paper forms uh, because it's easier to fill out, it's easier to carry around, easier to comment, it's more flexible in kind of any way, and it doesn't require any electricity. So for this user, uh, moving to the digital world hasn't kind of provided any, from their perspective, any, any additional value to their work specifically. It might have provided value to someone benefiting from the data outputs, but for them, this is uh, clearly not kind of an advancement to move to uh, a digital world through the digitization. And I suspect, at least when I talk to implementers uh, around the world, I think this is a, uh, not kind of a surprising thing. Uh, this is something I experienced many places that users, especially data, uh, people that enter data without actually using that data much, uh, let's say from a health facility somewhere, uh, doesn't always see the benefits of, of you know, having just a copy of the paper form in a digital format, typically just more cumbersome to to enter data. So I, I will give a couple of examples uh, of uh, what, you know, at least hints of digital innovation. If, uh, if we were to kind of do more digital innovation looking things with this kind of uh, uh, example. So at the University of Oslo, uh, we have this course, which the design lab is engaged in, where we, we have students, over 100 students actually, uh, working on building DHS2 apps as their kind of project work for the semester, um, which also provides an environment where we test a lot of app development resources. Um, and here we tried to give a case where we tried to see is there anything we can do with this data entry application uh, so that it provides a bit of additional value uh, compared to how it is currently that now it's kind of a copy of the paper form uh, but otherwise it's kind of, you know, uh, still the paper kind of wins because it's flexible. So we had some students making, for example, this application where you get an overview of deadlines and different types of forms and when they are due. So here we can, for example, see a specific clinic and then they can search their different data entry forms, which is then data sets in DHS2 for those of you that know DHS2 well. Um, where they then can see, okay, which forms are due soon, which are overdue and expired and so on and so forth. And then you can even get an overview of different health facilities and when, and now what, how many forms have a different status. So these red ones are something that is overdue actually. So they need to, looks like they have a lot to do, <laughs> the user that is using this. So what is happening here is that it's, it's not just a kind of digitization thing anymore. It, it has some hints of digital innovation. It's trying to, you know, add some additional value, which was not possible in the analog paper-based uh, regime. And I think the point is that there are a lot of examples of this out there uh, when working with users and implementations. We see a lot of these things that, you know, could be added to provide additional value to the HS2 uh, and to the and users, of course, uh, and which is, it will be interesting if we were able to act more on these, these kind of things. Uh, another example, which is a more extensive kind of digital innovation uh, thing, is uh, uh, a case where we uh, supported health logistics management, uh, 
especially uh, uh, reporting consumptions from health facilities of medicines and equipment and so on and so forth, um, where they earlier had a bi-monthly kind of reporting regime. So they reported every bi-monthly thing. They had to bring up these paper books where they had registered different transactions and then they calculate it and then they send it uh, uh, through DHS2 and then it's used for distributing medicines and planning and so on. So uh, the users there, they again, they prefer the paper-based regime or the, 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 the hospital store workers because that was this, uh, these paper forms were more flexible and so on and so forth. So in the course we experimented with what can we do to make it a more, um, you know, uh, useful tool for them. And then someone created this commodity dispenser system, which kind of removes the need for all this bi-monthly reporting and rather introducing a dispensing system where the user, every time they dispense commodities, they register it here. So then you eliminate that kind of, uh, or replace the paper based system for that. And then the reports are generated automatically based on the data that you enter kind of continuously through the system, which again then reduces, you know, the, the, the reporting burden that you have to do every by month. So that's also a, an example of um, of uh, trying to kind of think differently and, and building something uh, which provides value also to the, the kind of data entry side of, of, uh, of the DHS2. And again, this is uh, things that are powered by, you know, building in this case, web-based applications uh, for the DHS2. So we were quite quickly, I think in four weeks or something, the students had built an app that they were able to address uh, some of these basic needs in this use case. I just also wanted to highlight some of the kind of real innovations from out there. I think also an excellent example of uh, some kind of digital innovation providing new value uh, to someone is this uh, smart display app by Hispi Uganda, uh, where they, as they described it, saw a need that, you know, decision makers are sitting in a room and they are doing, you know, meetings where they are discussing and so forth. Uh, and then they saw that, okay, maybe we could you know, support this specific activity that they're doing by building an app that has this kind of slideshow of different graphs that they can kind of uh, use as a discussion arena. Uh, again, an ex excellent example, I think, of a, of a small but important digital innovation for DHS2. Yes, so that was a bit about digitization versus digital innovation. And um, again, I think there is a lot of potential to move more uh, of our design work also towards digital innovation uh, and not just the digitization part. Of course, there is always a lot of digital innovation going on. And I think maybe the data output side has, you know, radically improved a lot of aspects related to decision making and so on and so forth. But still, there is a lot of potential in thinking, you know, beyond the, the digitization of, of paper reporting, for example. Then another very relevant question is who are we building for? So for whom is the systems we're building relevant? And I, I, I found this very interesting uh, uh, thing in the news a, couple, a year ago or something, uh, where uh, a UK startup created, and then I'm quoting here, creates an uncomfortable toilet to increase workers' productivity, uh, which is called standard toilet. And you can see it here on the left-hand side, there is a toilet which is tilted slightly forward, which makes it uncomfortable to sit on the toilet for a long time. And the point is, uh, according to them, then to, um, to limit the time that uh, uh, their workers are spending in the toilet because people are sitting on their phones and, 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 and spending a lot of time in the toilet. Uh, which also brings a semblance to a Norwegian innovation many years ago in the late uh, 1700s, uh, which is called the Foldal Mine Toilet, uh, where this was built on the same principle. You see that it's tilting forward so that the user of the toilet uh, will get tired of sitting on it. So they spend as little time as possible on the toilet. An interesting question to ask uh, here then is, you know, who is this relevant for? Because here there has obviously been a design process and kind of an innovation process trying to solve uh, some kind of uh, issue, which obviously is, you know, relevant and it claims that it is, you know, uh, beneficial for someone. But 
it is obviously not made, you know, thinking about uh, the real kind of end users. Uh, as it says in the quarter, the main benefit is for the employer, not the employees. Um, and I think that's also relevant when building, you know, information systems and, and software for reporting. Who are we building? Uh, who are we kind of involving in our design processes? And who are we trying to make the system relevant for? Is it, uh, for example, IT project managers? Are they the ones that are driving the process and, you know, uh, deciding on all the needs and, and what, what should the system uh, be? And for whom? Is it the health managers on the top level or on the different level of the, uh, the, the health hierarchy? Uh, is it clinicians like nurses and doctors, if they are you know, users of the system? Or is it the data entry clerks, for example? And I think at least one, one group of users that might be sometimes neglected in some of the projects I've been involved with at least is the data entry clerks uh, with this you know, this data entry thing as a, as a readily uh, available example that, you know, it's for, for some people and maybe also for, let's say, nurses that actually are occupied with, you know, talking to patients and working with them. They also have to do this routine reporting. And then if the data entry tools are not providing any value, then it kind of, it is a burden rather than a benefit to go to a digital format. Yes, so the point being that, okay, there is a difference between, you know, digitization and making digital versions of paper processes and then trying to, you know, provide new and valuable capabilities for different users. Uh, and there is, of course, a kind of question, who are we building something relevant for? Is it for, uh, for top managers? Is it for uh, clinicians and uh, nurses? Is it for uh, yeah, different uh, people? Yes, so that was just to establish some kind of concepts and maybe create some kind of thoughts around uh, this. Now I will move a bit towards uh, specific issues and challenges of doing user-oriented design and innovation during DHS2 implementation. So as I mentioned in the DHS2 design lab, we have been uh, working a lot with, with implementation groups in concrete projects uh, the last couple of years or three years close to now. Um, and I thought I would share some kind of uh, thoughts and, 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 and uh, issues uh, that typically we have seen being faced in this, in this, uh, uh, by these practitioners. So a question that we, we, we think a lot about is, you know, how do we, how do we strengthen this capacity for user oriented design and innovation? How can we kind of promote more of, you know, building useful tools, apps, uh, and uh, promoting, you know, customizing the HS to 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 suit and be usable and relevant to to different types of end users. Uh, and I think there is at least, based on our experience, uh, three kind of dominant uh, and important aspects in these processes, which is both related to the software, uh, but then also to the practices of actually implementing the HS two and the competence and awareness and. Uh, kind of user orientedness in the implementation practices itself, and also whether the projects that you know the uh, the projects that the the HS2 is implemented through, for example, in collaboration with ministries of health or or with uh, different types of NGOs, does the structure and the scope and the mandates of those projects actually allow or provide any fertile grounds for? for doing any digital innovation and design with and uh, for end users. So I thought I would say a bit about these three different aspects. I think starting with the design flexibility of DHS2. So let's say we were uh, engaged in the implementation projects. We're implementing DHS2 within, uh, let's say, uh, NGO that has certain names and goals. Uh, and then we are discovering what kind of are the requirements and user needs in this specific case. Then DHS2 provides us with some kind of options on how to uh, address these needs. Uh, 
And the typically kind of the default mode would be to try to leverage the generic kind of core features of the HS2. So using the kind of bundled apps and the, and the uh, generic functionality as much as possible to address these needs. Um, meaning, for example, that, okay, we, we can use the data app to do this and that, and then we can use, you know, graphs in this and that way. We can configure, you know, and set up programs and stuff to, to, to accommodate this and that. Then if that kind of falls short, if there are requirements that are beyond what the HS2 generic features can couple, now there is an increasing kind of buffet of, of third party apps generic apps which are available in the app hub or you might find them on github sometimes also uh, which kind of increase the you know amount of features that that could be supported kind of out of the box which is great i think so i think again this you know feeding innovations from the local and to the global increases the chance that we have actually generic features that that could support you know different needs uh, then there are also the, of course, the possibility to build custom apps from scratch or maybe based on customizing some of the generic bundled or third party apps. Uh, where you actually then have the flexibility to you know, design exactly maybe what, what is needed and you know, come up with new features and, and so on. Or in the worst case, if any of these are kind of not applicable uh, to dismiss the requirement or renegotiate or redefine the requirement to make it fit with something that we have available generic or also maybe unfortunately from my perspective try to solve it through end user training so meaning that you kind of maybe see it as easier to to instead of trying to address this requirement by building a custom app for example you rather try to train the users and make some manuals and training so that they can kind of learn to work with the, the flaws of the system or the the things that are you know uh, let's say terminologies or the way things are organized uh, uh, so that it kind of still still works, even though we haven't had the need to actually implement any changes. And of course, just to mention that, that this arrow also goes in the bit of another direction, because of course, when you are in the an implementation context, uh, you typically also have in mind what is possible to do with the HS2, which then also actually you know shapes the there is kind of a communication between, of course, uh, on one hand, the requirements and the needs and the you know, the scopes and the aim that you initially set in the project and what is actually uh, defined as requirements that you want to address. But also the, these projects typically evolve over several years, of course, and then there be, might be totally new requirements coming up at one point. And then again, you will have to deal with, you know, how do you address them through generic means or through building custom apps. And I won't go too much into detail on this because of the time limitations here, uh, but there are of course uh, pros and cons with each kind of approach to addressing uh, needs. Uh, using generic features and third party apps is of course faster and easier than starting to develop custom apps and building things from scratch, at least traditionally have been so. Uh, on the other hand, the design flexibility is limited. You have to deal with what you kind of have, the, the, the generic features. Uh, and for the third party apps, you also have maybe some uncertainties regarding the maintenance of that app. If it's a third party app and it's not developed and maintained by the core team, you don't know what is, you know, is this going to be maintained in the future? Possibly then you have maintenance costs on your implementation on a later part. For custom apps, then you actually have a fle the flexibility to design exactly and uh, at least partly exactly the right thing. and the, thing exactly right, referring back to what we talked about earlier, uh, according to the specific user needs. But of course, then you have to develop the app <laughs> uh, and that app has also to, it has to be maintained locally unless you are able to kind of make it into a generic feature. So it could be more costly. As a note to that, I would say that this app development platform resources, which Austin talked about yesterday, is a great kind of example of how to try to keep the flexibility of developing custom apps while actually trying to eliminate or you know externalize some of these um, costs of developing and maintaining apps so with this app development platform now you actually have a lot of flexibility to design things but a lot of the aspects that goes into an app is actually maintained and developed by the core team so the the weight of that maintenance and development becomes less 
So it's going to be very exciting to see in the future how much you're able to kind of make it uh, keep the flexibility in order to you know, design new features, new functionality, new user interfaces based on local needs, while actually trying to you know, have as much as, the, uh, as possible of the development and maintenance work uh, kept on the core team or on the generic level. Of course, this option of dismissing or solving it through end user training uh, is not a kind of ideal thing many times, uh, but it happens a lot. So I've seen it uh, many places because it, of course, then doesn't require any custom development. But then, of course, the usability and relevance of the software might suffer if you're not able to build actually what what is needed and what is what is the ideal thing in that context. And again, then data quality, user acceptance, and and the potential benefits of digital innovation might then uh, you know, suffer. Yes, so that was a bit about this technical flexibility thing, moving back to this triangle again. The, one of the elements of capacitating user-oriented design innovation is about you know, having flexibility. And I think then the app development platform and the also SDK for Android is a great kind of advancement in this field, making it possible to easier and faster and cheaper create innovations, increasing the capacity here. But then also it's about design methods and approaches. So how do we actually then design when we implement the HS2? How do we go about uh, engaging with users and, and uh, doing these kind of things? So there are a lot of these design methods that have been developed to, to guide the kind of user-centered or user-oriented design. So there are, for example, this human-centered design approach, something called participatory design, which emphasizes a lot of participation from end users. And these have some kind of typical steps that uh, needs to be done in kind of a iterative manner, typically, to, in order to try to build both the right thing and, and uh, building that thing right, as they say. So one of them is to try to, when designing systems, you should uh, always use the existing practices and needs of users as a starting point. And this means that it is a kind of very important activity to try to understand what is needed by the end users. And of course, this always happens in an IT project. There is kind of a phase of requirement definition and requirement analysis and, and you know, defining requirements. But typically the argument in these user-centered or user-oriented uh, approaches is that this should not be dominated just by the IT project team and by you know, top level managers, but also involving the users that are actually you know, using this system on different levels. So for instance, then you know, when building a reporting system based on DHS2, one should then engage also with, for example, the people entering data at the lowest level and so on and so forth, and then understand what are their practices and needs, and then analyzing and ideating how can we then support this in a good manner. And I think uh, by looking at implementation projects, different places in, in um, uh, around DHS2, there is a lot of this going on already, and some places there might be you know, very dominated by top level managers and not maybe that much of user activities. And in other projects, there is a lot of, you know, going into the field, trying to understand how the users work, mapping out their tools and processes, and then, you know, basing the requirements on that, which I think is great. Another important aspect typically promoted by these approaches is that there is a kind of an ongoing iterative prototyping and evaluation process. So based on this initial understanding of the needs and the practices of the users, uh, one develops prototypes, which are then it ideally built very low fidelity at first, maybe just using paper. Uh, for instance, trying first to test out the concept. So is this the right thing? Starting with that. So understanding what would be a valuable addition to your you know, work and and then what could make things easier and what could address your challenges. Uh, and then maybe gradually building kind of more high fidelity prototypes, starting also to address how do we build this thing right? Uh, meaning, you know, more about is it intuitive and easy to learn and easy to understand and so on and so forth. So in a DHS2 example, that would be, you know, 
experimenting with DHS2. Uh, one issue typically with DHS2 is that since it's kind of, it's possible to very easily configure quite a high fidelity uh, prototype with the kind of generic DHS2. Uh, sometimes it could be easy kind of to jump past uh, more what is the right thing, which is maybe that easier when developing apps where you have you know, more flexibility and you can really explore, you know, what is the right thing in this setting, not just kind of bringing, always bringing the same data entry app, regardless of what you learn in the, in the, when you try to understand the practices and the needs. So how this typically looks in a DHS2 context in many places would be that you have this process of understanding the practices and the needs, talking to users, so maybe you ask them, tell me about your work, going out there in the field. Then they explain that, okay, we do this, and then we do that, and we use these tools to gather data, then we send it for approval here and there. And then what I think is very interesting is that if you are a very kind of experienced DHS2 implementer, then you already you know, have a lot of concepts in your mind. So you know, okay, when the user is saying, okay, we do this, and then we have this report, then there is kind of a analysis process going on in the head of the, the DHS2 expert listening, thinking about, you know, data elements, program stages, tracker, uh, you know, custom form, that's what we need for this. And then this is kind of an ongoing kind of mapping from the real world into uh, the world of DHS2 and the, the kind of uh, capabilities that are available there. Um, and sometimes we might also then think that, okay, here we actually need a custom app. But again, this is typically then, you know, much towards what are the budget of the project and what are the scopes and the aims. And sometimes maybe custom apps is not an option. And I think what is interesting is, you know, sometimes the output of this process, you know, going and talking to users and then analyzing and thinking about what could be built. Sometimes this uh, translates into a kind of a digitization initiative, at least for some users that, you know, now you're going to do this not on paper, but on a kind of digital copy of paper. And sometimes it actually results in, you know, more digital innovation kind of things. And I think, again, this is, you know, the, why this kind of could result in three things is one, how you do this first thing. How do you actually go about, you know, talking to users? What are the right techniques for, you know, are observing them or who to talk to and, and what to focus on when talking to them, which is quite difficult at times because you get a lot of information. And then what, how is this analysis and ideation process going? So what, what are you actually doing systematically to, to take this rich description of the world and the practices of the users into a kind of very concrete design? Um, so that's one aspect. The other is, you know, is it viable to think in terms of customization and building custom apps? How much flexibility do we have to not just use generic features, but actually, you know, experiment with, with, uh, with totally new kind of features. Um, and then as I will turn to quickly now is the, and then also, you know, what, what are the kind of scopes and the mandates in the project? Uh, is there room for, for thinking outside the box or has it already been defined that this is going to be, you know, like this, then maybe this not, isn't actually feeding that much into anything. And then uh, also typically in an DHS implementation, there will be something that is resembling these design approaches that I talked about uh, regarding prototyping and evaluation, where like, based on based on requirements gathered and the, the way you have kind of mapped this into DHS2, you present the uh, early version of a DHS2 configuration, for example, and you know ask how is this addressing the issues and is it working according to requirements? And then the users might say, you know, great, but we have some issues here and there. And then, of course, it's 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 the same process again. Is you know what is viable here? Is it possible to you know build custom features and and is it not? Um, and also to mention this again that here, since we typically start with the quite high fidelity prototype, a prototype that has a lot of functioning functionality we might sometimes then skip, you know, the very fundamental question of what is the right thing here. You know, maybe the users have been talking about a lot of, you know, issues that they have, but then we keep, you know, dragging in the same, uh, the same generic app for any kind of problem. 
instead of kind of moving out of the box and trying to build maybe a custom app, which could be another way we are doing design as a practice, or it could be because of we're suffering from a very tight project scope and mandate, for example, and so on and so forth. So then I will also then quickly turn to what I have hinted a bit about that this, this last thing in this, maybe also returning to this triangle that there is, you know, the, the design flexibility of the software that we're designing with is of course an important determinant on the kind of space we have for user and design. Um, what kind of design practices we're ad adopting, what kind of methods do we use for analyzing and innovating and ideating is an important aspect, but then also this the way the projects are geared and, and structured is obviously also a potential enabler or uh, disabler, maybe if that's a word, uh, to, to actually innovating and designing based on user needs. So some of the challenges that we have seen many times, I think, is that some of these implementation projects, let's say for an NGO again, or a, or, or a Ministry of Health or whatever, is, for instance, designed more as a kind of waterfall uh, process that, you know, that is very heavy on defining things in the beginning and then planning the whole kind of maybe three, four years of development in advance. And then there is very little room to kind of change the focus as, you know, the project moves along. So let's say, and that has been a constant problem in many countries, also including Norway, which where I'm in, where, you know, you start to build a so you plan the solution and then it's going to take four or five years to build it. But then as, you know, we get into the third year, for example, many of the requirements has already changed. Uh, meaning that, uh, meaning that um, you're kind of aiming at uh, you know moving target all the time and if you plan too much in advance it's very hard to kind of adapt to changes along the way and that also then results in or and you know another very difficult part of some projects is that defining what is the right thing to build is not actually part of the scope and the mandate so as uh, for example his group when you are working with the client, it's not part of your mandate to explore what is the right thing to build, which is an essential part, as I talked about, uh, in innovation. So if the project already has defined that, okay, what we're going to do is to take these paper forms and we're going to make them uh, electrify them, and then we're going to, uh, you know, have these kind of data outputs, which is supposed to resemble the old system and so on and so forth, then there is actually no room for, uh, for Kind of going down to the basics and exploring you know what could provide additional value in this in this context this also relates to another point which is about you know when you are building this system it doesn't typically just require a, a very technology focused change but might also then require changes to the organizational structures so let's say you're innovating you know the way approval processes are go going on, maybe you can e make you know less steps and make it easier, automate things and so on. That would also then of course require organizational changes, which then again might be beyond the, the kind of scope and mandate of either the specific his group in charge of designing something or the, the kind of technical team. Um, so then there needs to be some kind of collaboration, which could be very difficult. Uh, and then uh, I think maybe more, one of the most prominent uh, issues is to, you know, if, if it's not defined clearly that there is an aim and is a need and is a reason for engaging with end users uh, in the way projects are defined, then of course that is not going to be a part of it. It's not budgeted in and it's not kind of uh, designed into the way working and there we are seeing a lot of very different approaches in different uh, implementation groups uh, so uh, some for example you know really based the whole project around user-oriented design principles that okay we're going to work in this iterative manner and we're going to you know extensively bring end users into the process and prototype and doing these kind of things um while um 
uh, some projects, there are kind of a total lack of that kind of focus. It's totally geared towards, you know, IT, the IT management of the project and, and there is no kind of uh, uh, budget or flexibility to, to work with users at all. And then, of course, finally, this again, this issue with the software, of course, the flexibility of the software. If, if there is from the outset a very core aim to rely on generic features, that also, of course, shrinks the space of, you know, the ability to explore alternative ways of doing things if you're only going to use the, the standard, standard applications, for example. Yes, so so that was some of these uh, kind of overall challenges. And I think this is relevant for a quite large audience because uh, as for example, an implementation group and, and someone in, uh, specializing in implementing DHS2, of course, this is important when thinking about, you know, how do we design and what kind of practices are we designing with and how are we negotiating these kind of mandates and projects. And then also from the customer organization side, you know, creating awareness around the need for uh, for thinking in terms of users and innovation and design and making that part of the, the projects. I think there is a kind of long way to go there in many projects to, to and it is of course difficult. It's, you know, the, the balance between, you know, making project scopes and mandates that have flexibility for, you know, uh, finding potentials for innovation while at the same time, you know, making sure that it's not kind of getting out of hand because you need to have some kind of clear objectives. That's a very difficult, difficult thing. And it's one thing that we're also exploring together with some of the HISP groups in the design lab, you know, what, what kind of mandates and scopes are kind of balancing the need for, you know, control and trust and so on with the kind of right type of flexibility for allowing innovation and, and user oriented design to happen. And also not just, you know, building the thing right, but also then exploring how, what is the right thing to build in this given, given context. So finally, I will just wrap it up. I hope this, uh, some of these uh, topics, phenomenon and challenges that I touched upon was uh, interesting to some of you. Um, so I will just say a bit about what the future plans for the DHS2 design lab uh, are. So uh, what we already do and what we want to continue to do is work very closely with his group, but also uh, groups in different countries, such as India, Mozambique, and so on. Uh, but also with other DHS2 practitioners, uh, maybe in independent implementation specialist groups or, or user organizations in exploring, developing, and documented uh, best practices around these kind of design and innovation things. And especially trying to work together on, you know, looking at what, what are the current practices of trying to design and innovate and maybe also in kind of implementation of DHS2 in general. And then looking at, you know, what do we have any space and opportunity here to test out new kind of techniques and ways of working with mandates and processes to increase our kind of innovation uh, capabilities. Then we're also in the process of discussing to establish some kind of DHS2 design and innovation community. So let me know if anyone are find these things very interesting and would like to kind of be part of a more kind of open and global initiative on exploring these things. Uh, and then we're also working on this DHS2 user oriented design and innovation toolkit where we want to you know, combine this kind of related to these app development resources, but also focusing on the capacity related to conducting and you know, negotiating the mandates for user oriented design and innovation in in projects. So last slide, I just wanted to say that please write on the community of practice in this session Q&A, which I think is linked in the chat here, uh, or contact me on my email address at any time if you have any questions, thoughts, or ideas related to the things that I discussed in this session, uh, or if you have any experience with, uh, you know, doing user-oriented design and innovation and, you know, have some interesting uh, experiences with success or with challenges, uh, or if you have been involved in any concrete projects where you have been, you know, uh, again, either successful or found a lot of challenges with trying to work with users and innovation. Uh, and of course, also, if you want to learn more about these things, or if you want to collaborate with us in the design lab on exploring methods and understanding challenges about this, 
please, uh, please uh, write a post on the community of practice or uh, send me uh, an email. Yes. So I guess that was it for me. Uh, thank you very much for joining the session uh, and hope to hear from some of you regarding these things. And I'm looking forward to see the, you know, the, the future of DHS2, especially related to you know, innovation and apps and supporting an increasingly diverse and, and dynamic audience of users with, with usable and relevant tools. Thank you.